For those who do not know, in the calendar of God, there is a day set by him in every generation to make sparkling jewels out of those who fear him <laughs> because they speak to one another and meditate on his name. That's all they have to do. To keep on encouraging one another, to speak to one another, regardless of discouragement and negative circumstances all around them. In the calendar of God, there is a day marked down to make such people a sparkling jewels. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. I've read it to you when I compare the king's book of Chronicles, that of Ahasuerus, with, the, with God's book of remembrance. Malachi 3, 16 to 18. Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him. For those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. If you look in the middle column of your Bible, the word meditate there means they esteem his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day. Somebody say the day. Amen. There is a day in the calendar of God for days. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, huh, between one who serves God and who one who does not serve him. Tell your neighbor, now, in this day, the difference will be clear in the mighty name of Jesus. I perceive that that day has come in the nation of Nigeria. We are in the season that God will make us his sparkling jewels. This is far beyond the precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest. I'm not sure you're hearing me. Because with that precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest, he was only representing the people, but the people are now going to become the jewels made by God. <laughs> uh, I'm enjoying myself. You know, the high priest will go in and pray, He's not sure if he will return. So they will tie a chain around his ankle. So if they will wait for some time <laughs> and there's no evidence of life, they will pull him out of the place. And when your representative is dead, the breastplate on his chest means nothing. But we have a high priest who died and rose again and is alive forevermore. And he's not going to give you a breastplate with precious stones. He's going to make you his sparkling jewel. <laughs> we ourselves, the saints of God, we be his gems. We show up, we are shiny. I don't have the time to compare you with the devil. He's not your match, he's not your mate. With all his power, he's a fallen foe. If you count the jewels in the phylactery or the breastplate of the high priest, there were 12, yes or no? If you count the 12 foundations that are done with precious stones, there are 12. Count all the precious stones in Satan, there are 10. He's lower than us, he's under our feet. Who will shine brighter than Satan. It's called Lucifer, morning star. 
But thank God for the bright morning star. You don't know there's a difference between the morning star and the bright morning star. It doesn't matter the hour of the day. Jesus in you is going to manifest. He's going, and you are going to glorify him. Men will see you shining for God. And they will glorify your father who is in heaven. Can I hear amen? The word jewels in this passage means special treasure. Special treasure. How many of you know that if you treasure something, you value it, you don't throw it anyhow. You keep it. You preserve it. You hide it somewhere that somebody will not just come in and steal it. Exodus chapter 19 verse 1 to 6. Now, a little bit of comparison between us and those who are before us. In the third month after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Revidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God. That was what happened to me last Monday. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Daughter, you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure. To me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. When they heard this word, the day means those words with faith. Huh? The day enter into his rest. So that I will make you a treasured treasure to myself. This is what you tell them. They will become a kingdom of priests to me. So God did not just start with us calling us or Jesus making us to our God, kings and priests. It began with Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse number 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. If you are Israel or you are part of Israel, would you not reverence God for making you special? They rebelled and rebelled and rebel until God had to swear an oath in the wilderness and lifted up his hand and said, none of you except Caleb and Joshua, except those under 20, none of you will get to the promised land. That will not be your portion. Yeah. Now let's go into the New Testament and look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. God is making a similar offer tonight, and I want to see those who jump at it and say, Lord, we will do what you want us to do because we want to be that special people to you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here we are. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now I've obtained mercy. Who, who, who does this apply to? I can't hear you. Eh? This applies to you. And you are sitting like that, like you made it happen. Huh? Are you sure? Are you sure this applies to you? That you are a chosen generation? A royal priesthood? A holy people? A peculiar people unto God? That you are brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the time to thank him. To bless his holy name. To give him glory and praise. 
for what he has made of you. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. Lord, we thank you for making us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your own special people, that we may proclaim the praises of you who called us out of darkness <laughs> into your marvelous light. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. You may be seated. The question now to ask is, how does God make his jewels? How does he make his jewels? And who makes his jewels for him? How does God make his jewels? The jeweler who makes God's jewels for him is the Lord Jesus. Is called the coming messenger. And he purges us like silver and gold. When he's purging you, it's not going to be easy. He will subject you to some fiery furnace. But at the end of the day, there will be no single impurity. And when he looks into the gold or silver he's purging, he will see his picture and say, the job is done. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Do you look like Jesus? Hello? I cannot hear you. We are going to do some DNA this evening. Do you really look like Jesus? Be honest with me. Do you know what Jesus looks like? In human history, has there been any people who look like Jesus? You are murmuring. Who are those? Huh? The disciples of Jesus looked exactly like him. They looked so powerfully like him. They looked like him such that they could not pick him out of the twelve. Until Judas Iscariot said, the one I kiss, that's the Messiah. And Jesus said, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? There was no special halo on his head. That was why he could pray his high priestly prayer. In John chapter 17, that I have finished the work which you have given me. He had not gone to the cross, but he had reproduced himself in his disciples. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Paul the apostle said in Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And in Galatians 1, he said, when he pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me, I did not confer with flesh and blood. The other day, my son, Shagun, did what he called Word on Wednesday, and he said, if Abraham is your father, you must look like him. He said, let me give you evidence. I want to show you two pictures, and you'll see whether I look like my father or not. I couldn't believe my eyes when he brought the two pictures together. It's not just carbon copy. It's still a version of me. Do you look like God? Do you smell like him? Do you sound like him? Oh, nobody had ever sounded like Christ before. Let's go to Antioch. Why were they called Christos, Christians? Because they were talking, they were walking, they were doing everything just like Jesus. How many people would like to be like Jesus? <laughs> I want to be more like you. <laughs> oh, Lord. I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you walk through. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Malachi 3, 1 to 3. Behold, I send my messenger, 
and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. What will he do? He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. When you and I are purged, when you and I are squeezed into the mode of the Lord, when we begin to look exactly like him and we offer unto him an offering in righteousness, then there will be trouble in the clamp. When the jewels of the Lord offer to him an offering in righteousness, judgment befall upon sorcerers, upon adulterers, upon perjurers, upon exploiters operating among the people. So as you see many being elevated, you also see the downfall of many. For this is the destiny of Jesus Christ. It was brought forth for the rise and fall at which, at which rise came before fall. It was, it was raised for the fall and rise of many in Israel. I don't care who that Vashti is occupying your position. If you have subjected yourself to the training of Mordecai, every zero in your life pretending to be heroes will be removed. And God will elevate you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I can't hear your amen. amen. If God will push Saul onto you, don't begin to rejoice. Because he's just taller. He has no strength. Until Goliath will show up, who was taller than him, you will discover that God will now use someone shorter than both of them to destroy the enemy of God. May you become a mighty instrument in the hand of God in this season in the name of Jesus Christ. Malachi chapter 3 verses 4 and 5. Malachi 3, 4 and 5. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former days. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. I want you to rise on your feet and Lord, put a difference in our camp. In the name of Jesus, let no sorcerer get away. Everyone who is an exploiter, every robber, in the mighty name of Jesus, within your church, in the nation, let there be a difference between them and us. In Jesus' mighty name, shut the mouth of every sorcerer, shut the mouth of every exploiter, every perjurer, every one operating in the spirit of the evil one among the people of God. Expose them in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Not only that, those who plunder God's people and rob them will not escape the fierce judgment and severe judgment of God. That judgment began recently in our nation, and it will not stop until such plunderers and robbers are completely neutralized and uprooted. You didn't hear me. The judgment on plunderers and robbers had begun recently in our nation. None of them will escape. Almighty God will neutralize them and will approve them. And what is meant for the benefit of the people will be released in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 17, verse 12 to 14. Isaiah 17, 12 to 14. Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas and to the rushing of nations 
that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them, and they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Next verse, thank you. Then behold, at even tide, what? Trouble. And before the money is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. It does not matter where they are hiding in the villa, in the palaces, in the ministries, the em whoever is plundering this nation and robbing us in the banking sector, in the judicial sector, in the political sector, in the name of Jesus, God will uproot every plunderer and will put an end to the activities of robbers in our nation, in the mighty name of Jesus. Before you take your seat, I want you to know that reward is spiritual. A young man was trying to play fast with me recently. I shook my head for him because he doesn't know who he's dealing with. Reward is spiritual. That's why God is a rewarder. Reward is not something you casually deal with. Reward is spiritual. First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 8. Paul comparing himself with Apollos. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I plant Apollo waters. Who is the rewarder? Oh. Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 6. Reward is spiritual. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26, reward is spiritual. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Why? Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to what? To the reward. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. Why did Jesus allow himself to be crucified the way he was crucified? Hebrews 12, 1. One to two, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, is asking us to run without clothes, without any covering. Take away every weight, anything that can become any load on you. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Who is our example? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, does the word. The joy of seeing you rise, the joy of seeing you flourishing, the joy of seeing you become king and priest to our God, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, Despising the shame, and I sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's hear him speak to us. Revelation 22, verse 12. And behold, I am coming how? Quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. My dear brothers and sisters, how you manage your appetite for reward is vital to who you are becoming. Whether you be a noble person or a scoundrel like Nabal, the husband of Abigail is up to you. But denying that you want a reward is not humility. It is stupidity. So get over yourself, watch your motives, and use reward to inspire and provoke you to accomplish 
things for the kingdom of God. Can I hear amen? amen? I do not want my reward in heaven. I've taught you that before, whether it annoys you or not. I want all my reward on earth, and when I finish, I will get all my reward in heaven. I'm not settling for part payment and dear a little here so that when you get home, you will enjoy. No, all the reward that are meant for me here, I will get all of them. And when I get to heaven, I will not have to cry seeing those things that I was supposed to enjoy on earth. Start up and say, oh, all these were yours, but you did not know how to accept them because you do not know how to get into the place where your inheritance in the light is stored. Lift up your hands. Lord, everything that is needed, everything that you have apportioned for me, that you have appointed for me on this earth, I thank you because the just will get their recompense from the earth. I thank you that the recompense that are needful for me on the earth, I will get them all. And when I get home, I will still get my reward. 100% reward on earth, 100% reward in heaven. In the mighty name of Jesus, I bless your holy name this day. Reward is spiritual. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Now sit down for the next one hour or so. I want to take you to a realm you have not been. Beyond all that we did earlier today, comparing the spiritual with the spiritual, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, just like comparing or sharing between 12 precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest and the precious stones that are done the 12 foundation stones of the heavenly Jerusalem, Beyond that comparison, do you now see yourself as God's sparkling jewels? Did I not read that scripture to you just now? Give me Malachi 3, 16 to 17, in case someone is sleeping in class. Malachi 3, 16 to 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Do you fit into this? They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them. Not make for them. On the day that I make them, what? My jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked. <laughs> And between one who serves God and who does not serve him. Do you see yourself as God's sparkling jewels? Yeah. Let me go beyond that. And I shared this with you in the morning session. For those who are not here, I would like to repeat it. Do you see God laying your stones with colorful gems and your foundations with sapphires? Do you see God making your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystals, and all your walls of precious stones? Isaiah 54, verse number 11 and 12. If you are angry, make sure next time you change your date of birth to 11, 11, 54. <laughs> Isaiah 54, 11. Oh, you afflicted one, toast with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. This is not heavenly Jerusalem. This is you. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your worlds of precious stone. Can somebody say, that's me? Do you see God making a difference between you and the wicked? Yeah. Making a difference between those of you serving him and those who serve him not? Yeah. We are not going to pass the same way. All other princes can eat what they like. We will now manage with lentils and some beans. But when you test us after 10 days, we'll be 10 times wiser than they are. We purpose in our hearts not to defile ourselves with the king's portion of meat or drink. 
Can I hear amen? amen? We are conscious of reward, but we know about delayed gratification. I will repeat my question that I asked in the morning, then I'll be able to give you principles and practice of walking in the fullness of your God-given inheritance. I want to ask a few questions. I hope you brought your answers because I read them to you. You know, many times Jesus will ask questions so that he can help people to gain understanding. Number one question, is God your father? Yes. Pastor Dukpe Oyekunle, is God your father? You didn't answer. You are writing, I asked a question. Before you write, answer, is God your father? Yes. How do we know? Elder Bode, is God your father? Where is the proof? He taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven. That's enough for me. I believe in his prayer and I pray it. He's my father. I have a father in heaven. I'm not talking about my natural father who died in 1957. I'm talking about the one, who can, the one that can never die. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not only that, when he rose from the dead, Jesus told Mary, do not touch me, Mary. Because I'm ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. Matthew, I mean, John chapter 20, verses 16 and 17. John 20, 16 and 17. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni. I like that Mary. It was special. Uh, if anybody had said that, uh, this is the way he called her. He knew who called her. I said, God will give you a name that others don't know. You'll be in the midst of the crowd. They will call you. Others will think somebody is just making a noise, but you will know clearly. Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, the same person I'd been talking to, considering him to be the gardener. But when she heard her name, the way it was mentioned, he said, ah, no gardener can call me this. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God, the father of Jesus, the God of Jesus. He's my father. He's my God. This is why he gave me the Holy Spirit, that Christ Abba, Father, on the inside of me. A Father that you know by experience and by his dealings with you. Not just religiosity, not just religion. You know you have a Father. Is God your Father? If God is your Father, is he poor or rich? Don't mess up around me. Is God rich? I cannot hear you. Yes. Is God rich? Yes. Is he your father? Yes. How rich is your father? You know, I said to you that the problem between Shegun and I is that Shegun's father is richer than my father. And one day we got home, and Mrs. B said, how do you know that? If your father built the house that he built in 1922 and he's still standing there, he built it on a river. You built your own, <laughs> not on any river. Do you think you are richer than your father? I said, we'll compare when we get to heaven. Because I had to fix his house for him. <laughs> Is your father rich? 
Well, I will give you four answers. I hope that will be sufficient for you. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 to 12. First Chronicles 29, 10 to 12. Therefore, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. Who did he bless? And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, for some time. On Christmas Day, when things are good, when things are bad, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to some people. Who needs God's strength this day? Rise to your feet. I need your strength, oh God, in my inner man. I need your strength in everything that I do. I thank you, eternal rock of ages, because you can give strength to all. Now, I'm not going to be a weakling. I'm not going to be a beggar. I stand before you today to receive the strength of the Almighty on the inside of me. I will go in your strength. I will march in your strength. I will do all things in your strength. No diminishing returns in my life. In the mighty name of Jesus, I give you glory and praise. Thank you, Father. Do you know Jesus' blood was shed to receive glory and power and riches and dominion? And he didn't take them to heaven. He stretched forth his hand and blessed everyone. Because he will not need them there. Sit down. Psalm 24, 1 to 6. Psalm 24, 1 to 6. The earth. Huh? Where is that? Kilimanjaro? Mount Everest, River Nile, River Niger, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, all the gold mine, all the silver mine, all the oil mine. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, established upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive who? He shall receive what? Blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Why did he say this is Jacob? Jacob left home with nothing. He returned with two bands because he had the blessing. You are returning home today uh, with what is called my hand and blessing. You have double portion in the name of Jesus. You came here empty. You are going back home fully loaded. In the name of Jesus. No matter what you brought here, what you had before you got here, you are going to receive double in the name of Jesus. Psalm 50, verse 7 to 15. Psalm 50, 7 to 15. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Ladies and gentlemen, I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Mention their name. Lion, tiger, chimpanzee. Call them by any name. They are all mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and not its fullness. How rich is your dad? 
Agai chapter 2. Agai chapter 2, verse 6 to 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and sea and dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver, it didn't say silver. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Who owns gold? Who owns silver? The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Say to your neighbor, gold belongs, to my gold belongs to my father. Silver belongs to my father. All the treasure of the planet belongs to my father. My father is rich. One day, I think it was first or second year of Shei in the university, called me on phone said, Dad, I said, yes. Do you still give scholarship? I didn't know where the question was going. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, I want to know if you still give scholarship. I said, yes, I give scholarship in Naira. <laughs> Why are you looking down, Shay? Is it not true? He said, there's a classmate of mine here. His father is also a pastor, but they've not paid his school fees. Can you help him? I told him you can give scholarship. I said, hey. <laughs> I said, okay. I will pay this time. Oh. I let his father go and look for money also. <laughs> Why did she do that? Oh, my father can help you. Who can boast of God here? Who can tell God? Who can tell people that my father can bless you? My father can change your circumstances. My father can change your situation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters in our common faith. If God is your father and he's as rich as we have just mentioned a little bit. <laughs> if God is your father and he's a very wealthy father. But you, his son or daughter, are begging because you do not have enough. Then there is a disconnect. And you are about to misrepresent him if care is not taken. Talari kekpe ho afi wo baba. Maje ka ye bere. Polonu mi dao. Talari kekpe ho afi wo. Maja ka ye bere, mi dao. As I told you in the morning, the accurate diagnosis of your financial lack is actually called power failure. Because in Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, The Lord God is the one, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which is what to your fathers, as it is this day. That covenant is still fresh, is still alive, is the one that gives you power to get wealth. So if you don't have wealth, you have power failure. So the last question is, go over this. What next? What options do you have for your survivor? What are you going to do if presently you are poor and broke in this season of global farming, hyperinflation, and stagflation? For those who do not understand what stagflation is, it only means they are total strangers in Nigeria. You want to tell them, my wife, what stagflation is? Stagflation is what I call economic agbako. <laughs> which Omalu Abi cannot farada. <laughs> you understand me? I want you to understand it very well. What is stagflation? Economic agbako. Which Omalu Abi cannot farada. If you like, you can call it economic imbroglio. 
that is an unwanted, difficult, acutely painful, confusing situation full of troubles and problems that the government of Nigeria, past and present, have brought upon our people like legacy poverty transferred from one administration to the other and now compounded by the indiscretion of this present administration. By definition, you can check Google. Stagflation is a portmanteau word combining inflation and stagnation. That is where Nigeria economy is at now. An economy in stagflation has high consumer price inflation, low economic growth, and unusually or usually rising unemployment. For those in CGC, see, we cannot say that we have not been sufficiently prepared before now. By the word of the Lord, we're told that the looming global famine we are in will defy logic because green trees will dry up while dry trees will flourish. We know already that the high and the mighty will crash and be brought low, while the lowly will be elevated and lifted up. Also, in the midst of this severe famine, some will have a feast, while others will perish with hunger, especially those who despise the prophetic word. People of God, in order to avert this disaster, in order for any believer in here or elsewhere, in order for them to avert this disaster, I present to you 12 essential truths, like the 12 foundational gemstones that you need to know and live by. And once you know and embrace them, then you can access and appropriate your God-given inheritance, the inheritance of the saints in the light. The 12 essential principles are as follows. Principle number one, God has blessed us. He's not about to do it. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to bless us, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Is that clear to you? Do you believe that? Do you receive that? Do you embrace that? Only 10% are asking me. Yes. Principle number two. The exact location in the heavenly places where Christ is seated with our blessings is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but that which is to come. This is the level where there is no devil. Where your spiritual blessings are located is far above all principality and power. You find that in Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Write it down. You're going to meditate. You are going to believe God. You are going to trust God for everything that you are receiving today. Principle number two. Your blessings are beyond the reach of your enemy. Your blessings are beyond the reach of your enemy. Yeah. Principle number three. For us to access this level where there is no devil, we must receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ so that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened in order to locate, access, and appropriate our blessings in heavenly places. As the prayer prayed for the saints by Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 13 to 18. So write it down, apostolic prayer by Paul the Apostle for the saints, Ephesians 1, 13 to 18. 
It must be some prayer you master. You know it by heart. It flows out of your spirit man. You put the enemy in his place. You let him know you are a forbidden territory. And so are your resources. They are not subject to inflation, deflation, stagflation, or depression. Principle number four. Because our blessings in heavenly places also constitute what the Bible calls the inheritance of the saints in the light, therefore God qualified us for those blessings by translating us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love, which is the kingdom of light, so that we can be partakers of sin. Is that clear to you? I can't hear you. God qualified us by translating us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, their son, the son of his love, which is the kingdom of light, because that is where the blessings of the, or the inheritance of the saints in the light, that's why it's located. And therefore, no force of darkness can approach it. May I give you this solid assurance that you stop worrying yourself about anybody hindering your blessing. Because it's tormenting your soul. You are given too much power to the devil. And by the way, do you know that it's your father who promised to rebuke the devourer? Why don't you go to sleep and thank him for the work he has done? And trust him that what is yours cannot be kept by another person. This is why we are requested to give thanks to God always. Colossians 1, verse 12 to 14. Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I want you to rise today and say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. In respect of my finances, in respect of my resources, in respect of my wherewithal, in respect of my inheritance, the inheritance of the saints and the light, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Amen. Please be, just, be seated. Principle number five. Are you following me gradually? Principle number five. As the entrance of God's world brings light and understanding to his people, it also eliminates darkness so that our translation to the kingdom of light completely renders us inaccessible to, to Satan and his courts. The moment you receive the light of his word, you are a terror to Satan. The entrance of your world brings light and understanding to the simple. When you receive and embrace that word, it eliminates darkness. And your translation to the kingdom of light completely renders you inaccessible to Satan and his courts. This translation is mainly by the grace of God and by his express command. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we are with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, 
not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves by Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. I like the next verse. Ready? Read. For it is a God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We are going to shine just like he shone. It's my command. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? God commanded light to shine out of darkness. Satan was completely confounded. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. He thought he had covered and cornered everything. Let there be light. May light shine in your life. May light shine in your situation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Principle number six. I like, I like what Martin Luther, the reformer, did. Martin Luther, the reformer, was writing his thesis one day and was writing and writing and Lucifer showed up. He was so angry. He took his inkwell and threw at him and he disappeared. And he said, oh God, I wasted my ink. Principle number six, because of time. According to Ephesians 2, 4 to 6, God who is rich in mercy towards us because of his great love for us, as by grace made us alive while we were dead in trespasses and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Is that very clear to you? Can your eye of faith capture that? Are you seated in Christ and with Christ in heavenly places Far above every principality and power, dominion and might. Huh? If you truly believe this, please know that it is from this vantage position that we have access to heaven's perspective. And therefore, we can love at barrenness. We can love at farming. We can love at destruction. Whenever any of them and their allies show up, because that is what Christ who sits in heaven will do. Rather than crying and grumbling, it's time to start laughing at barrenness, at unfruitfulness, to start laughing at destruction and at famine. First Samuel chapter 2, verse number 1, listen to Anna. And Anna prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Can you imagine when Samuel was born and Anna looked at Penina and just smiled? <laughs> he had sons and daughters. What were their names? Benina had sons and daughters. Obi Majobi Eku. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 4. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth said themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. <laughs> he who sits in the heavens. I'm not sure that you understand this. <laughs> hey, hey, 
Egba Mio, Talon Jam, Tajan Juru. The kings of the head were plotting as can you see? He will sit in heaven shall love. The Lord shall hold them in duration. You can read Job 15, um, Job 5, 17 to 27, and, and embrace it and apply it and make sure you operate in it. Job 5, 17 to 27. Oh, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. Job 5, 17 to 27. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. May you never be abandoned by God. Yeah. Happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven. No evil shall touch you. Are you ready? In famine, he shall redeem you from death. In war, from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. Amen. You shall not be afraid of destruction when he comes. Amen. You shall love at destruction and famine. Amen. You shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Amen. For you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field. Amen. And the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. Amen. You shall know that your tent is in peace. Amen. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall also know that your descendants shall be many. Yeah. And your offspring like the grass of the earth. Yeah. You shall come to the grave at a full age. Yeah. As a sheaf of grain ripens in its season. Yeah. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear it. You must know it for yourself. I say you must know it for yourself. Yeah. How many of you believe that in times of famine you can be satisfied? How many of you now believe and know and you are sure that despite the rate of exchange between dollar and naira and in spite of the prohibitive cost of living because of hyperinflation and stagflation that you'll be satisfied in farming? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Stand to your feet. Psalm 37 verses 18 and 19. Psalm 37 Verses 18 and 19. The Lord knows the days of the upright. And my inheritance is not for some time. <laughs> the Lord knows the days of the upright. And their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine. They shall be satisfied. I want you to turn to God tonight and say, this is my season of satisfaction in the mighty name of Jesus. This is my season of satisfaction. I give you glory. I give you praise. I give you adoration, Father. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Sit down. Principle number seven. Am I rushing too much? Principle number seven. I mentioned to you earlier that in order for us to access the inheritance of the saints in the light, God, who qualified us for shame, also delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of, of the Son of His love. You find that in Colossians 1, 12 to 14. Do you still remember that? Based on that, this Son of God's love into whose kingdom we are translated is now the true image of the invisible God. Don't call yourself an Adamite. Adam is a, continu a discontinued line of production. The last Adam is. And in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, his express image is presented to us. I'm leading you somewhere. You are going to dance. You are going to jump. You are going to rejoice. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the, by the prophets, thank you, as in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the words, who being the brightness, this was what 
the Legacy Youth Fellowship camped around, I think, last year or so, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself pushed our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What do you think he really, really, really obtained? Just a more excellent name, the name of Jesus? Ah, because he's the express image of God. For that reason, all things created in heaven and the earth, both visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, were created by him and for him. As a result, all of them combined together to work for his good. You didn't hear that. Because of who he is, all things and everything created in heaven, on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, they were created by him and for him. And as a result, all of them combined together to work for his good and in his favor. Colossians 1, 12 to 16. You are going to see today and from tonight, when you sleep, if any devil enters, you will snore. Yeah. Martin Luther was sleeping one day. Again, Lucifer showed up and he opened his eyes. Oh, it is you. He just turned to the other side and he continued sleeping. My father mentored Dr. Somra while he was in Malina. He was sleeping and a demon spirit entered the room and shook his bed and pushed it. And he woke up and said, get out! And he fled. And Dr. Somra said, wait a minute. You shifted my bed. Come back. Push it back to its position. That will be the level of authority you operate in. The mighty name of Jesus. Colossians 1, 12 to 16. Given thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the... Say, I am qualified. I am qualified. My Father has qualified me to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of sins he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. None of them can be against him. Is that clear? That leads me to principle number eight. Now, if all the forces of nature and the paraphernalia of government and governance, including thrones and dominions in the social, economic, and political realms, all combine to work for the Lord, then all of them put together must also work in our favor. If our operational base is the same place where Christ is, created, is seated, all things must work together for our good. Can I hear amen? amen? Romans 8, 28 to 39. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called. Whom he called, this he also justified. Whom he justified, this he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Say to your neighbor, if God is on your side, there is no other side. He who did not spare his own son, 
but deliver him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. You are hereby discharged and acquitted. In the mighty name of Jesus. From every disease, from every sickness, from every ailment. In the mighty name of Jesus. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things. This is, not the, this is not the church I thought. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Fellow citizens of the kingdom of heaven, at this juncture I appeal to you by the message of God to please listen attentively to me because we are about to enter the deeper depths of this pure truth. By God's grace, I intend to spend quality time here. Do not be in a hurry. I appeal to you for your own sake and for the sake of the generations yet unborn to please give me your maximum attention. Do I have your undivided attention? Yes. Principle number nine. In order for all things to work together for our good, then Christ... And Christ alone must have preeminence in all that we do individually and collectively. In order for all things to work together for our good, then Christ and Christ alone must have the preeminence in all that we do individually and collectively. Colossians 1, 16 to 18. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. It is the preeminence of Christ in the church that qualifies us for the inheritance of the saints in the light. You can read Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. You can read it in Colossians 1, 17 to 18. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. Colossians 1, 17 to 18. If you take away the preeminence of Christ in the church, all things will not work for your good. In case you don't know, there are many synagogues of Satan. When God arrested me on Monday, and I said, Lord, why are your children not being blessed? Why is your church not being blessed? He said, it's not my church. Imposters have taken over. Lord, have mercy. And I look through. I can stand here for hours and preach this one message. That Christ has stopped having preeminence in the church for a very long time. You read 3rd John. It will mention the atrophies who love to have the preeminence. You read Revelation chapter 3. The church that made Jesus sick. That he said, I will throw you up out of my mouth. Because you are neither cold nor hot. You make me sick. He said, you think you are rich. You are wretched, you are naked, you are empty. This God 
Almighty Jesus, the head of the church, who was at the center of the church in the book of Revelation chapter 1, is now standing at the door and knocking. Let me come in. Let is my church. It's not your church. It's my church. They now rule by not the word of God, but by their constitution, by their by election. Jesus does not have preeminence. The pastors are getting richer and the people are getting poorer. Until Christ will have preeminence in the church, all things are not worked to God for our good. Together for our good. I appeal to you by the mercies of God, do not jump to those who pay lip service to Jesus being the Lord. Senior pastors, overseers, imposters, who have become Alpha and Omega in the church. This is the problem. How can God bless his people when you have blocked him out of the way? I can give you many examples. I don't want to waste my time. May God not make you the atrophies in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that God will flush out all the Lord bishops and grandmasters of the occult, wearing long 24 karat gold chains around their necks and signet rings in their fingers. May God flush them out of his church so that Jesus can become the Lord of his church one more time. Go listen to the message I preached years ago. Bible ways to relate to your pastor. The Bible says you must treat them, esteem them highly for their work's sake. It didn't say you must exalt them. I'll keep quiet. I made enough enemies. But God knows that they will not last any longer. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can you imagine me putting the giant-sized picture of Tunde Bakar in that corner and the giant-sized picture of my wife in that corner and then on the rooftop of my place, putting another picture there so that you know the, the nigger in charge? <laughs> I will build my church! He said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If the gates of hell are prevailing against it, it means it stopped building a long time ago. Be careful. If he does not have preeminence in this church, all things are not what together for our good. Can I hear amen? amen? Principle number 10. Whether the pastor or the church members, our core value must be humility. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God who in due season will exalt us. He does not just want the congregation to be humble. He wants all of us to be humble. Humility goes before honor. A haughty spirit goes before destruction. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 to 11. The elders who are among you, Elder Bode, are you hearing? Elder Elvis, are you hearing? And all the other elders and pastors, are you hearing? The elders who are among you, I exhort. I whom am a fellow elder and a witness of the sovereigns of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Next verse. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you including the elders, be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility for God receives the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Proverbs 18, 12. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Another translation puts it this way. 
pride first. Pride first. Then the crash. But humility is precursor to honor. Principle number 11. In addition to the foregoing, please recall the virtues of faith, hope, and love that were possessed by the Colossian church, as I mentioned last Sunday. These virtues enable them not only to see with their enlightened eye of understanding the inheritance of the saints in light, in the light, but also to be able to bring down to the earth such things as they needed whenever the needs arose. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. We go back there one more time. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Colossians 1, 3 to 6. We saw that last Sunday. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the Hope which is laid out for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Which has come to you as has also in all the word and is bringing forth fruit as also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Please permit me again to spend quality time on these virtues of faith, hope and love more than I did last week. This is because I do not want any of you shortchange in any shape or form in 2024, our year of unusual and uncommon elevation. Peter the Apostle, who wrote in his epistle that our inheritance is incorruptible, is undefiled, is, is, it does not fade away, but is reserved for us in heaven, about to be revealed in the end time, clearly stated that the virtues of faith, hope, and love must be entrenched in us. First Peter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 17. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since we have purified your souls, in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Did you see faith in that context? Did you see hope? Did you see fervent love? If you don't find that in a church, they have no access to inheritance of the saints in the light. There you have it. As far as Apostle Peter is concerned, if you cannot love, you cannot lead. It requires fervent love for the brethren to lead God's people. If you are greedy, you will use them like disposable napkins. Those who love people will use money, and those who love money will use people. Gaskiani. Last Monday, as I further combed all the epistles of Paul to the different churches, I found out that more than the Colossians church, 
the infant Thessalonian church should actually receive the trophy of the church that fully embraced and entrenched these virtues of faith, hope, and love in themselves. Give me Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 to 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 to 4. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you. For you all making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing what? Your work of faith. What next? Your labor of love. What next? And patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. If you don't find those elements in any church, it's as good as a dead church. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. If you don't find that in church, you're wasting your time. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of this is love. Love covers multitude of sin. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you had from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. If you don't receive this word as word of God, you have wasted my time and you have wasted God's time. I pray that will not be your portion. Amen. Principle number 12. Finally, if I'm today asked what is there to perfect in your faith, what is there to perfect in your faith that you may have on in that access to the inheritance of the saints in the light and experience the days of heaven on earth. I will mention four vices that those who operate in faith, hope, and love must avoid. Four vices. I will keep those four vices to the vigil. Uh, but there are the vigil. We must deal with it. I will just mention them to you right now. The first vice is offense. Offense. You wait till the vigil, by God's grace. And the vigil, next vigil, is not missionary force vigil by, by the uh, auspices of the Holy Spirit and the, 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 the mercy and grace of God and the desire to see saint prosper. It will be all saints vigil. So that every believer can come. The first vice is offense. The second vice is strife. The third vice is bitterness. And the fourth vice is hatred. Offense. Number one, strife. Number two, bitterness. Number three, and finally, hatred. If any of this is in you, it will be counterproductive. You'll be bound by bitterness. You'll be afflicted by iniquity. You just discover that you are not making any progress. There's only one prayer we'll pray as we go to the communion table. All these four vices we'll deal with are the vigil by God's grace. And every work of Satan will be uprooted in your life. Luke chapter 3 verse number 9. This is what John the Baptist said. I don't care how long they have been rooted in your life, the vice of offense, of bitterness, of hatred, and of strife. And even now the ash is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Stand to your feet. The, the, the root of offense, the root of strife, the root of bitterness, the root of hatred, they must be completely uprooted in your life. When you hate, you are in darkness. You are blind. You cannot take part in the inheritance of the saints in the light. You can only hate sin and hate with perfect hatred, whatever God hates. You can't hate any brother. You can't be bitter. You can't entertain offenses. I want you to take the ass of God's word 
lay it to the roots in your life. You know what is punishing you, what is afflicting you. No more bitterness, no more offenses, no more hatred, no more strife. Abraham said, let there be no strife between you and I. Strife will go to the root of your increase and dry you up. No more bitterness in the name of Jesus. Set us free. Lay the axe to the roots of trees that the Father has not planted tonight. Thank you, Father, for the grace you have supplied sufficiently in this house that this man will walk with these principles. They will access the inheritance of the saints in the light. They will draw them down to the planet Earth and manifest your glory to their environment, to their families, and to their nation. In Jesus' name. I'm reading from Philippians chapter 1. Verse 9 to 11, Philippians 1, 9 to 11, and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in the knowledge and all discernment. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but so that the world may be saved. I pray the love that sent Jesus to the cross will permeate our atmosphere and environment Amen. that will truly love God and love our brethren in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the bread. Give me Philippians 1, verse 9 again. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. If you have love and you don't have discernment, you can misplace your love. God will guide you in the way you love so that people will not take advantage of you. In the mighty name of Jesus. And that you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. I pray that offense will not become counterproductive force in your life. Amen. You cannot be offended and anointed again. On the cross, while his blood was flowing, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you stand to pray, forgive if anyone has offended you. For if you do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. Lord, as we receive the blood tonight, cleanse us from all offenses. Yeah. Every shape or form of offense that will contaminate our lives, take them away from us. Yeah. We lay the acts of the world to the roots of offense to the root of strife, to the root of bitterness, to the root of hatred. Take them far away from us. In the mighty name of Jesus, receive the cup. Thank you. Give me that verse again. I'll pray one more time. Thank you, sir. Philippians 1, 9 to 11. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. In knowledge and discernment, in the name of Jesus, I pray because you are preaching discernment, people will not take advantage of you. And these I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without wax. You are not a pretender, you are not a hypocrite. That you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. And finally, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Can I hear amen? amen. Lift your hands to heaven tonight. Thank him for this day. Thank him for this night. Thank him for downloading stuff in our hearts from heaven. Thank you that you are beneficiaries of it. And Lord, in the name of Jesus your access to your inheritance is granted 
and your possession is more or less a no-brainer. You will access, you will possess, you will obtain, you will apply, you will use for the glory of God in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And the people said, Amen. Amen.